Hello, everyone. Hi there, everybody. I just want to make sure everybody can go ahead and join in. If you're streaming in, feel free as you all join to type in where you're tuning in from in the chat. Um, let me go ahead. Yeah, we'd love to hear from where you are. Oh, we see Idaho and Texas. I'm here in Brooklyn, New York. So welcome everybody as you join in. My name is Gabrielle Oates and I work with Innovate EDU and the Educating All Learners Alliance. Uh, and today we are happy to welcome you to our webinar on inclusive lesson planning for educators. Uh, and now you see, of course, that um, you are muted, but we do have our lovely chat feature. So we really encourage you to use that throughout the session. If you have any questions for our speakers, feel free to add them there. Hopefully we can answer some of your questions throughout. And if not, um, we can follow up with you afterwards. Uh, now, in terms of the Educating All Learners Alliance, um, the Alliance was started in response to COVID-19 earlier this year in April. And essentially we are a, a coalition, an uncommon coalition of organizations who strive to uh, promote best practices in the field of education, particularly for special education. And so any chance we have to spotlight a great resource like this, we are happy to. Um, and so some of our founding partners of ELA are the following organizations you see here on the screen. And we have a growing partnership of over uh, 60 partner organizations as a part of the Alliance. Um, and now if you are interested in participating in the Alliance or want more information about similar webinars like this one, um, as well as to see the recording of this session, you can check out educatingalllearners.org. Um, and we did actually just release a new podcast yesterday. So you're welcome to check us out on Spotify and other platforms. Um, but today I am very excited to bring up our presenters. Um, and so as you see on your screen, we have, um, first we have Elizabeth Hartman. Uh, and so she is an asso associate professor of education at LaSalle University and a consultant at CAST. We have Deborah Taub, who's the Technical Assistant Specialist at the Thai Center. Allison Posey, who is the Curriculum and Design Specialist at CAST, as well as Jose Blackerby, the Senior Director of Research and Development at, at CAST. And so they'll be sharing with you throughout today's session, um, as well as some of our invited guests, who many of you I see in the chat are um, tuning in to see and to share. Um, and so we have Mark Turk, who is the inclusion coach at Carroll County Public Schools, Audra Ahamada, Deputy Associate Superintendent of Assessment at Arizona Department of Education, and Naomi Fair, who is an inclusion specialist at University of Washington. So we are so excited to welcome all of them to speak today. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it on over to our next presenter. I want to thank Gabrielle and Erin in EALA for inviting us to talk to you today about inclusive lesson planning and in particular the 515-45 tool. So I want to kick us off today with a story about a teacher we met um, and by we I mean the team developing the tool that we're going to show you today. And this teacher, her name was Amy. We met her at the start of our journey to design resources for teachers collaborating to create inclusive lesson plans for all learners. And what's interesting about Amy is she was referred to us because she had a, um, a really great passion for inclusive education. She was uh, known to be very committed to inclusive education and she had lots of great experiences. And so we pulled her into a focus group to really see what we could learn from her. So we started the focus group and it was really clear Amy's passion and dedication. She went into teaching because she felt like all learners should have access and engagement with the general ed curriculum in the least restrictive environment. And in fact, she um, was one of the leaders in her state around inclusion and training other educators on how to make lessons more inclusive. Um, but as our focus group can 
continued. She revealed that she was no longer working as an inclusive educator um, and had returned back to working as a special educator in a school solely for children with special needs. So this quote here that's up on the slides is, is from her. She says, I left another school to come back to my center school because there was such a disconnect between special and general ed. It can be hard to make those connections, especially as a new teacher to the team. So after the focus group, we had this moment like, wow, look at um, how collaboration and making connections with her general ed counterparts was so much of a barrier that she decided to leave this job as an inclusion specialist and in work that she so deeply valued. So the team presenting today, we really decided then and there that whatever we designed to help teachers, it needed to get to the heart of Amy's struggle. And Amy really showed us that collaboration around inclusive um, lesson planning is important. We, we know we should be doing it, but perhaps it's a little bit harder and um, makes teachers feel a little more vulnerable than we realize. So with that, I'm gonna pass it to my colleague on the team, Debbie Taub. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what Liz just talked about in terms of inclusive education and collaborative planning and teaching in terms of the research. So the first thing we know from the research is that inclusion works and it works for our all kids, including kids with the most significant cognitive disabilities, those students who typically take the alternate assessment. In fact, there's a new research piece out there uh, where they did a study where they looked at 15 kids in a segregated class and 15 kids in inclusive classes over the course of four years. And the difference in achievement in communication, literacy, and math was really significant. 100% of the kids in the inclusive class made progress in communication skills and literacy, 93% made progress in numeracy versus the numbers in the segregated class or separate class where they were making, um, you know, about 73% of the students made, prog made no progress in communication and literacy and 67% made no progress in numeracy and some of the students even regressed. So we know this is important. And we know collaboration is important because it's one of the essential practices, it's one of the key practices of inclusive practices. So without collaboration, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to have inclusion. So this tool is really something that's really important for moving us forward in that. And with that, I'm gonna pass off to my next presenter. Uh, I wanted to uh, just give a little bit of background about uh, how this work came to be. Um, many of us uh, on the call and who are presenters uh, are working on a federally funded center uh, funded by the Office of Special Education Programs intended to support uh, inclusive practices. Um, the name of the center is TIES. It's always hard to remember what TIES exactly stands for, and there won't be a quiz later, but it stands for Time, Instructional Effectiveness, Engagement, and State and District Support for Inclusive Practices. Uh, the TIES Center is led by the, uh, the University of Minnesota, and then there is a, a collection of other universities and nonprofits that also participate. Um, uh, the TIES Center, like many federal technical assistance center, is trying to achieve its goals by providing multiple levels of technical assistance, um, universal technical assistance, targeted technical assistance, and intensive um, technical assistance. Um, as Gabrielle mentioned, um, a number of us uh, on the call here um, work for an organization called CAST. Um, we are best known for um, our role in the development of a framework for addressing learner variability called Universal uh, Design for Learning. And I'll be talking about that uh, a little bit more in a moment. Um, however, uh, for the last, I would say, 10 years or so, in addition to thinking about UDL as a, a design solution, we've also adopted another approach to uh, designing solutions, which is called, aptly, uh, design thinking. Um, and design thinking has been growing in lots and lots of 
different fields, but only recently been uh, applied to educational problems. Um, this graphic shows you uh, what the process is like, but the first part of it is this idea of empathy. You want to think about who your stakeholders are, whether they're teachers, whether they're students, whether they're parents, and really, really understand, try to, to understand what their roles are, uh, what their challenges are, what barriers they face, and really get as clear a definition of what the problem is that you're trying to solve. Once you have a handle on what the problem is, then you want to generate ideas about ways to uh, solve it, to mitigate it, and build a prototype and then test it. And then it's you do it all over again, right? We try to uh, go through multiple design cycles. Um, with any luck, uh, they get uh, better with each successive uh, with each successive iteration. Okay, so. Um, Central to um, design thinking is this idea of personas. Um, personas are kind of prototype uh, roles. These are sort of archetypal uh, individuals. So they're individuals, but they represent a class of individuals who have um, common uh, challenges, interests, and backgrounds and needs. Um, we were led through this design thinking process uh, by our um, colleague, uh, Cassie Sell. I don't think she's here, uh, but none of this would have happened without her, so we wanted to mention her. Um, and, and in the case of ties, um, we realized that um, for inclusion to work, there's really this ecosystem of professionals. It's not just the teachers or or just general teacher or special teacher, the whole bunch of, of um, professionals, all who sit in the in the system in different places and all who have different uh, challenges but who are all necessary to make inclusion work. So through a series of focus groups we established these five personas um, organized in order of uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Um, they won't be surprising to you probably. Obviously a special education teacher, an instructional coach, a principal, a general education teacher, a parent, um, and a speech language pathologist. So um, while once we developed these personas, uh, we went through a series of focus groups, and through the focus groups, we asked them a bunch of questions about, about inclusion, about inclusive practices, uh, what was difficult about it, what was easy about it, um, nothing was easy about it. Um, we also showed them resources uh, about instructional planning or um, instructional practices, uh, we asked them where they went to go when they tried to learn something new. Um, so we tried to learn a lot of things about around background, and that we brought that into our original design. As we went through the design cycle, we went back to pro the professionals again to get some feedback. Did we get it right? Did we miss something? Were, were we using the correct language? And so we did that multiple times, and that really was part of the design system, that the design process that led to the 515-45. Um, so I mentioned earlier that um, we at CAST are best known for uh, universal design for learning. And if you haven't heard of it, um, you will probably be hearing more about it. Um, universal design for learning is a framework um, that is based on neuroscience. And uh, it's based on uh, networks that we all have in our brains that, that serve different functions. There is the Affective network, which is the why of learning. It governs our motivation, it governs persistence. The second network is called the recognition network, which is the what of learning. That's just the stuff that we run into with text and numbers and, and facts. It's our ability to manage all of that. And then there is the strategic network, which is the how of learning. And that is associated with planning and monitoring and then adjusting uh, in, in response to all of that. We all use these networks all the time. They're central to education, but they're central to everything. And we all use them very, very differently. We use them differently in, uh, within a network and how they work together. And the, the fundamental point about um, UDL is that all that variability is a good thing and we want to design solutions that embrace that, do not, that do not uh, ignore And, um, and so that's, that's part of our, our DNA, and we've applied that um, throughout the development of the 51545 and, to, uh, and also in the TIES Center work in general. And I think uh, I can turn it over to Gabrielle now.
Thank you very much. All right. We uh, sort of think about, um, you know, designing these lessons, particularly with a lens of inclusivity. We just wanted to gauge um, where you all stand at that point. So I am going to drop a poll that you'll see here. And I would like you all, if you're willing, to answer. And so our question for you is, what are the biggest barriers that you face when designing inclusive lessons? So you'll see now on your screen, the options are time, having somebody to collaborate with, um, having it not already ingrained as a part of your school routine, and needing more instructional strategies. So I'm gonna go ahead and sit for a little bit while I let you all answer that poll on your screen. And if you aren't able to access the poll, you're welcome to type in your answer to the chat. So again, the question is, what are the biggest barriers you face when designing inclusive lessons? And then our options include time, having somebody to collaborate with, not having it a part of your school routine, and needing instructional strategies or needing ideas for instructional strategies. Wow, it looks like our results are very spread out across the board. I'll give a few more seconds and let everybody respond there. Again, if you can access the poll, feel free to drop in the chat your answer. All right, thanks for everybody who voted. It looks like a lot of you are very much spread out over the options of not having enough time, not having it already a part of your school routine, and needing some ideas for instructional strategies. Uh, and so we, we hope to kind of answer some of those questions today. And one way, um, we're actually going to share a quick video with you now on a way that we think could help you with some of those complications. Based instructions for all students, especially those with significant cognitive disabilities. Hi, welcome to the TIES 515-45 tool. Educators can use this tool when planning standard-based instructions for all students, especially those with significant cognitive disabilities. Collaboration can begin, whether you have 5 minutes, 15 minutes, or 45 minutes. Grab your lesson and colleague and let's begin. If you need help finding a lesson or reaching out to your colleague, here are some resources to help you get started. With five minutes, the tool can help you and your collaborative teaching partner identify the most important content and instructional methods during the lesson. If you can't find five minutes to meet face-to-face, -face, you can use the tool remotely through Google Docs. With 15 minutes, the tool can help you and your collaborative teaching partner build more understanding of the lesson. You will identify, remove, and reduce potential barriers to learning that can ensure all students, including a student with significant cognitive disabilities, can access and engage in the lesson. Check out the UDL-inspired Inclusive Strategies resource under the 15 Minutes tab for lots of ideas of how to reduce barriers in your lesson. With 45 minutes, you can extend your collaborative planning to think about the overall classroom structures and adult supports that can be integrated to support students with significant cognitive disabilities. Let's click to get started. All right. Um, so as you can see from the video, we are excited to share with you all the 51545 tool, which I'm going to make available on your screen right now, um, where you can uh, save the tool and access the tool. And so we'd like to thank Hansley, one of our partners at the Arizona Department of Education. Um, and 
just to provide a you know brief introduction into some of what the tool provides, which we'll go a bit more in depth now in later slides. Um, so each section that's mentioned has the parts of a template to guide discussions with questions, some success indicators, a downloadable uh, printable template, um, an example of teachers, and some additional resources. So I'll go ahead and pass it over. Let's take a look at one section of the 51545. Um, we wanted to give you a taste of um, just what one part would look like so that you would um, be enticed to check out some of the other sections as well. As you could hear from Hansley's video, the tools organized around time and how um, much time you have as a teacher to dedicate to collaborate. So we're gonna highlight the 15 minute section. When you get to the 15 minute section, you see a template and this template guides you through a collaborative discussion with a colleague and it does so using both questions and success indicators. So in this 15 minute template, the guiding questions focus you and your colleague on the content of the lesson and the instructional strategies of the lesson. And the thinking behind this was that if a general and special ed teacher, maybe even a related service provider, whoever is supporting inclusive instruction in the classroom could really get on board with understanding what the, the main essential content of that lesson would be and how those uh, professionals are going to come together to support learning of that content, then that's a great place to start. And in fact, if you were to look at our five minute section of the tool, just those two main questions on content and instruction are what guide the 15 minute part of the tool. So this is Allison, you said it's okay to interrupt. And I just wanna put in all of your all's head that um, this can apply whether you're in person, remote, some hybrid mix. So again, try to imagine the different contexts that it can be used and I'm gonna back out again. No problem, anytime. Yeah, so um, we um, have this template in different forms. So you can actually um, use it just using the website. It's available as a Google Doc, you can print it out. Um, and that I think is really useful because <laughs> we all know now in the situation we're in with COVID that we need that flexibility of um, having, having different tools whether we're at home, whether we're collaborating online or we're in person as well. All right, so back to the um, 15 minute template. Um, what differentiates it from the five minute template, it, it actually adds a couple more questions. Um, once you and your colleague get on the same page of what you're teaching and how you're gonna teach it, um, that we push you to think about what's one barrier in the curriculum, in the lesson. Um, and what might be one way to remove that barrier for um, a student with significant cognitive disabilities. But although we're focused on that student with significant cognitive disabilities, because that's our main work at TIES, what we really are wanting you to do is create a solution that will support the entire class. Um, and we'll uh, show you some of the resources that will help you to do that in a, a little bit. So um, the five minute template is a leaner version of this, just focused, focused on content and instruction. And then the 45 um, minute template is um, an expanded version of this template with more questions and more success indicators. And um, we encourage you to check out to see exactly what that looks like. Okay, so here are some of those more options um, that you'll see when you visit that 15 minute section. Um, you'll have a link to that printable template or um, that link can also go right to Google Docs so you can download it or email it or start working on it collaboratively with your colleague. Um, you'll also be able to hear a recording of teachers um, using the template. And um, that's really nice because it provides not just the prompts, but it shows you what kind of rich discussion comes out of going through the process of this template. And then the next thing we want to um, 
highlight for you is this resource that is embedded into the 15 minute section called inclusive strategies. And this is a real UDL inspired um, resource for teachers. So when we were going through that design thinking process, one of the things that we heard from teachers is that often they're just looking for a little bit of a spark of an idea um, when um, you know they're working on a lesson together um, it can be really um, hard to collaborate because time is tight and that affects their creativity and so what they need is like a list of strategies or something just in that moment that can give them um, an idea that they can then work from. So we designed this inclusive strategies resource to do just that. It organizes the main curriculum barriers that we've seen for all students, but especially those with significant cognitive disabilities face during learning. So here's an example of one inclusive strategy from this resource. Um, one barrier that may come up in lesson planning is that um, curriculum might not allow for students to activate their background knowledge or experiences, which we know is important to comprehending, um, especially new concepts. So teachers who come to this resource or this section of the tool can um, click on activate background knowledge and see a list of strategies that will reduce that particular barrier in the curriculum. And then they can use these strategies um, to add, they can add them to their lesson or maybe even think about redesigning their lesson so that the, they're focusing their instruction on that part of the tool. It's Allison dropping it in. <laughs> I do want to highlight a comment that was made in the chat that's really helpful that parents, students, and teachers can also collaborate as the lessons are planned. So I'm just thrilled that you're thinking broadly about how this really is a conversation starter that we hope um, can, can just deepen learning um, with whoever you're collaborating with. So I want to thank you um, for noting that. And, um, and also just to emphasize, Liz said this, but I I just can't emphasize the importance that we found in framing the barriers as being in the design of those goals, methods, materials, and assessments, and not being in the student themselves. So it's very easy to fall back into that language of, I have a student who, and we really are trying to encourage you through the use of this tool to say, there's a barrier in. And that right there is empowering to students, to educators, to really think about reducing those barriers and getting to that high level learning that we vision and that that Debbie mentioned at the very beginning that we know those inclusive environments can really help to scaffold. Um, and, and they are loosely, for those of you who love UDL, uh, they are loosely aligned with the UDL guidelines. So if anyone does want to really think about it in that way, we'd love to chat with you about it because we had you know, a really good time trying to think about how those all connect with the guidelines. And, sorry, thanks. Um, and say that one of the things that Liz has been talking about is that spark of an idea. And the reason for that is because one of the things we found in doing systems change work is that if you give teachers kind of everything they need to do one lesson, then they know how to do one lesson. But if you can give them sparks of ideas and give them processes to follow, then they can do anything. And so really that's kind of what we learned during the design process. And that's what we're really aiming for in this is that giving people sparks of ideas so they can really think about how does this work best for my classroom, my setting, and my students. Awesome, thank you guys so much. Um, I wanted to add just a few more tidbits to entice you to go and check out the tool and click through some of the resources um, because I think they really speak to a lot of the um, barriers that you were voting on in the um, poll. So some of the other resources that are embedded throughout the 51545 uh, tool is we have some text. So let's say you're a little bit hesitant maybe to reach out to a new colleague. You don't know how to write that first email to set up that collaborative time. We have you covered. We have some prompts that you um, can um, cut and paste from our 
site and you can send off a text or email and get that collaboration started off right. We also have some um, words or texts that you could use to advocate for your own um, dedicated collaborative time. You could send that off to perhaps an administrator um, or you could work with your collaborative partner and send that off together. Um, we also have agendas for how you might want to set up your collaborative planning time um, and set expectations for using that time well. And um, for those um, teachers who are starting off at the beginning of the year, we also have a really comprehensive planning guide and checklist to help you at uh, the beginning of the year to get your collaboration set right. And I think that would be a great resource to keep in mind, especially as um, schools are transitioning back and forth between um, distance learning, hybrid learning, and in-person learning. Um, if you're making that transition back um, from one form to another, that would be a great checklist to really um, get that collaboration started on a strong foot, especially if it's something that um, needs a little bit of attention after all the upheaval that we've been through. All right, so now I'm going to pass it back to Gabrielle and um, our invited guests so that you can really hear um, their thoughts about the 51545 um, from people who are actually using it in the field. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and stay off camera to let our panelists shine. But um, you know, we've talked about our poll, we've heard a lot of people's thoughts on challenges they're facing, areas they need to um, focus in, what they're not able to access with their school. So we are excited to have our panel join us and talk more. So I'll go ahead and let our panelists join on. Hi, all. <laughs> uh, well, as you join, and I'll let you all, um, you know, set your cameras up, I would love to kind of dive a little bit more into what we discussed in the poll. Um, and so I guess my first question to you all would be, what are some of the barriers that you've seen in regards to inclusive lesson planning? Well, I think, um... You're right, you did hit on a lot of them in the poll. But I think there were some too that um, <clears throat> kind of got addressed pretty early on when uh, Elizabeth was sharing at the very beginning how the attitudes of um, different people in the building. So how does gen ed look at special ed? How, do, how does administration feel about inclusion? Uh, how do the team members feel about um, paraprofessionals and the work that they do? Um, because when it comes to planning, you know, all those people are important and all need to be there. But um, so if they're not all at the table, it makes it can make planning uh, pretty difficult. And uh, Naomi, Audra, and Deborah, do you all have some experiences or things that you've, you know, heard from others that are challenges that they're facing? Yeah, I can go next. So, um, one of the things I've noticed this year um, is just the finding of the time and then structuring that time has been a really big challenge, especially when um, co-planning is happening in the context of a across and within virtual and hybrid learning. Um, and teaching environments during the pandemic. And I think this is especially challenging when and teachers are working across grade level teams, across multiple PLCs, um, and across different places. Um, and, you know, I think that this can lead sometimes to something I've been seeing is in-person special education teachers feeling the need to opt out of having their in-person students joining virtual gen ed instruction, for example. Um, and sadly, you know, this can mirror what happens when we are in person in non-pandemic times, right? And so these are, I think, challenges that a lot of teachers are facing right now. 
Hi, this is Audra, and I think I can kind of add to both of the comments that have already been shared. Um, I was an inclusion specialist in a district and a teacher myself, and I think one of the other barriers that I saw quite often was that special education teachers in general did not feel comfortable all the time um, if, if a teacher was teaching slope or, you know, equations, maybe that you didn't feel comfortable knowing the content. And so I think it's important that this tool can facilitate um, some of that, you know, what is important instead of you having to know everything that's important. So again, I think um, that comfortability that you might have working with your collaborative partner because you maybe don't know the content, but this tool can take that barrier away and allow you to talk about, you know, very specific pieces. And then even if you don't know, you can say, okay, well, I can con contribute in this way. Um, and I, I think really just getting away from that that view that I'm not doing it right or I might not how to do it perfectly, but that just using this tool as a guide um, may help get over some of those uh, challenges or barriers. Actually, um, kind of leaning into my next question, um, if you all would care to elaborate a bit more on some of the ways that the tool has supported your work, um, you know, and ways that people here could could utilize it. I have um, seen a tool like this, you know, used before. I used to send out a little message saying, you know, what is, you know, what should we talk about? Who should we talk about kinds of things? But what I like about this specific tool is it has those guiding questions and they're appropriate for five minutes, um, 15 minutes or 45 minutes. So again, not only if, prior to, I think, seeing this tool, I thought, you have to think about the questions you're going to ask, you have to know the content, and you have to have a relationship with your collaborating teacher or partner. And now with this tool, um, it's taken away some of those barriers. So again, those guiding questions, you don't have to think about what to ask. You don't have to, you know, spend time worrying about that. The questions are already embedded. So, uh Naomi, I think. Worked as a co-teacher and we only had 20 minutes to plan. And to us, we felt like after we caught up, exchanged a few anecdotes, right? We only had a few minutes left. And I think we felt like really trapped and really stuck and limited in our work together, even though we had the best of intentions. And I keep, you know, as we get more into this, the tool and the value and potential, I, I just keep thinking if someone had handed me this tool, like, what could have happened? Some beautiful things, right? Just we needed, we didn't have at that point in our careers that language and that structure to set those intentions, to set that culture between us. And and I keep, you know, imagining our work, what it could have been like with a tool like this. So I'm, I mean, I'm very excited by the potential for it. In, uh, in Carroll County for a while now and it really does help keep that focus when you when you get together you know what you're going to be talking about you know that you know this is why we're here it keeps us all on task it keeps us moving forward um, you're right because when you get together you know everybody is kind of catching up with each other they're you know talking and um, you know you've spent the first 10 minutes of your 15 minutes just catching up with each other. And uh, so it, it really does help you know, keep, keep you moving forward, strategically planning. That way you're right, when, you, when you've got it there in front of you, you know exactly what it is you're gonna be talking about. So I, I think it really helps to keep, keep things focused, keep things moving forward as you're planning. And I think touching on what Naomi mentioned about the word culture, that was such an important note to think of how as we develop generally quality lesson planning, but also, um, you know, with the focus of inclusivity um, and ensuring that it suits all learners, developing that culture at, at the basis level of understanding and collaboration will really enhance achieving those goals. So I think that's a, a great point to say. Uh, and now, are there any, you know, last points that you all think people should really um, keep in mind or focus on when keeping this tool in their back pocket of resources. Well, I did want to. I would just maybe oh, add that I'm kind of going back to what Deborah was saying. 
oh, I'm sorry about that spark. That that is really important as well. That this is a, a set of questions that will guide and push you forward and get you thinking. But it also is that spark that you can think of other things. Um, and so again, it's not an end all be all to lesson planning, but it is kind of set in that mentality of a spark. And I appreciate that as well. To let in a general teacher, one is in person and one is um, teaching virtually. And when they told me, I was you know, working with them to build their collaboration and they sort of felt like they had to confess to me that they only had 15 minutes and they felt really bad that that was all they could find for collaborating. And as soon as they said that number, I was like, oh, they need this tool, right? Like they, they felt like they were admitting some terrible truth. And I was like, we've got to dig into this tool because you can still set that intention. You can still build that collaboration, that culture around UDL, right? That powerful language, even with those 15 minutes. And I think even though that should not take us away from advocating for more intentional, consistent, and like sufficient time, it can't be a roadblock. And this tool kind of, you know, makes it no longer a roadblock by providing a bit of structure to support that starting point, similar to what you were saying with that spark. Mm -hmm. That you're already doing, uh, you know, inclusive practices, and you get a teacher who's never done it before. And it, it really helps them to, you know, I've, I've been able to hand it to um, one of our related arts teachers just recently to say, look, he, he was like, I have no idea how to do this. I have no idea how to plan. And being able to say, okay, well, here's where we can start. Here's a tool that we have. And it really has um, helped him to connect with what we're doing and to get a better understanding of, okay, oh, so that's how it works with us. This is how I can do this as a general music teacher in, in, in including these kids into my classroom. Absolutely. Well, thank you all so much. Um, those are, you know, the questions that were really on my mind to discuss with you all. And I think it gives everybody a good uh, mental framework to use when thinking how to implement this tool um, and share it with others. And so I am going to go ahead um, and continue on now, and I will go ahead and pass it on over to my colleague, Liz. Um, thank you, panel. That was so great. It's one thing to talk about a tool, but it's another thing to really hear how it's coming to life out there in the field. So I really appreciate um, having you here today and um, taking the time to be with us. Um, so we're not finished with our design process. <laughs> uh, so there are two more features that we're really excited about that are going to be released in the new year. First, we're adding a resource called um, Inclusive Big Ideas. And this really speaks to what Audra was talking about before, where if you're an inclusion facilitator, um, working in a school, you might find yourself in many different classrooms, um, you know, supporting lessons of many different um, topic areas, content, and you need that little support to help you to um, refresh on the content and, and really see, um, see, see that you can like go into that collaborative relationship and feel that little bit less vulnerable and more empowered. So we thought, why don't we make some um, inclusive strategies resource, kind of similar to the inclusive strategies resource we showed before, but make it very specific to the most common curriculum standards and frameworks. So here's an example of um, the very beginning of a reading literature um, inclusive big idea that we created. This is a sixth grade standard on comparing and contrasting different representations of a topic. And so underneath this will include, again, those little sparks of an idea of how people could actually teach this. So for example, you might want to pick an anchor text such as the book Wonder, and you could have the classroom both watch parts of the movie and then maybe read um, or experience the text 
that um, goes along with the book as well and then use that to compare and contrast. So that's just one idea, but for each of these um, standards or frameworks, we have multiple ideas that tie right back to that framework. And what we found in our design process is that the general ed teachers really like this section of the resource because they can go to it, look up their curriculum framework or standard, and then immediately get some great ideas that are very um, specific to what they're teaching and will help them to be a bit more um, inclusive. So we also have another um, uh, section to this um, as well that gives um, teachers, gen ed or special ed, a quick refresher on the most essential content related to that standard. So um, that will allow um, you to go look up the standard really quickly and then just get some quick bullet points of what's most important about that. And then we have this pro tip section of this inclusive big ideas resource as well. And that has in it common student misconceptions, tips for reducing common curriculum barriers. It ties back to some of our other resources. And um, again, they're very specific to the standard. So um, this will be really um, a great resource for both general and special ed teachers. And um, they were very useful to us in this design process in developing this so that it meets their needs. We're also adding another feature. Um, we showed you before that on the site, there's um, an audio of teachers using the template. Well, we um, have decided to actually use videos of teachers as well. So we're gonna add those videos in um, just as another representation of the collaborative discussion. And I think that's really important, especially for those teachers who might not have a colleague um, or might not have developed that relationship yet. I think it's important to, to really have models um, and see what this looks like. And you'll notice um, in the video here, the screenshot of the video, Audra is uh, one of our teachers. So thank you, Audra, for being a part of that resource. I do wanna take a moment here to give you a chance to ask questions. I know there was one question that was sparking some really interesting conversation in the chat. And that's, are there any tips for getting buy-in from, from someone who should be collaborating? So there may be folks who are willing and they know, you know, yes, we need this collaboration, but what do we do when the barrier is that someone just doesn't, you know, doesn't show up to the table. So um, there were some ideas um, that that were that were in the chat, um, such as um, you know modeling, starting small, maybe showing how this collaboration had an impact on a student to kind of you know encourage the why. Maybe like it's just five minutes. You know we can just start with five minutes. To, you know kind of show that the collaboration doesn't have to be um, extensive. It doesn't have to be one more thing on your plate. Um, you know this idea of so much of um, how to build and buy-in relates to um, who's already on your side. So kind of thinking about who you can, you know, to turn to to really be able to um, support inclusive practices. But I wanted to see if there were any other ideas from anyone on the panel or the Cast Ties teams um, for encouraging that collaboration. This is Audra. I was it off with um, someone that I heard, you know, um, was really like, when I was a new teacher and a beginning teacher, she was really, you know, oh, you know, these students are doing so great. I'm so proud of my students. So someone who had a mind of, of being inclusive to begin with. And I went to her and I said, you know, I'm really interested. I have a student I think would do great in your classroom. Um, I've seen some of your lessons and I think they're so engaging. And so we started off that way. So we're like really praising her work, um, but then making a relationship and connection. And I just think that is also so valuable. Um, and again, this tool, I keep going back to the tool. I love it. When I saw it, I was so happy um, thinking that that can help make that connection for people. It's not just something we're doing as a spur of the moment. There's real intent. It's documented. We write it down. We discuss it. And so, again, just building relationships with as many teachers as you can um, and really look like taking time to go see what they're doing. I think that shows value and interest. 
Um, and then you can say, oh, this part of your lesson or this part of your day could really benefit some of the students that, that are here at our school. Fabulous, thank you. And you know, I do think we we asked the poll questions intentionally. You know, thinking about those barriers around time, collaboration, routine, strategies. So we we hope that this tool really helps address all of those. Um, whether you're COVID, you know, non-COVID, um, wherever we are in in our teaching, whether you're a novice or you've been teaching for decades, that that this tool will um, help you build those routines that can create a new culture um, that will help you spark those strategies. But also, really importantly, and this was also mentioned in the chat, but that subtle use of language that can be so powerful and how we frame barriers and how we frame abilities. Um, so really thinking about um, how this tool can hopefully scaffold your time, your collaboration, your routine, and your strategies. And we invite you to take action. So we hope you don't just go, that was a nice webinar, and take off. We invite you to take a few moments here, check out the site, and share the resources with someone. Start that collaboration right now that can be a 30 second we don't have a 30 second prompt but that could be a 30 second prompt um, and maybe take action now to reach out to a colleague and set up a time to work through the tool and you can say we only need five minutes <laughs> so you only need five minutes um, so we do invite you um, to take action and we're happy to see if there are any other additional questions um, before we before we say our goodbyes Yes, several of you are asking for the links. So I do want to emphasize that all of the links to everything that we talked about today is in, are in that digital handout. Um, you can get additional resources from the Thai Center, from CAST, and everything that was mentioned today, including some of the research that Debbie was talking about um, around um, the, the success of, of inclusion. Uh, those are all available in that digital handout. And we're thrilled to see people saying that you're looking forward to looking into the tool more and sharing it. So thank you for taking some action today. And I'll just add to um, as we close out today that um, as Jose mentioned in the beginning, you know, our design work is not done. We continue to reach out to people and see how they're using the tool, um, how we can improve it, how we can adjust it. We know we're not going to ever get it right because there's just so much that's going on and changing moment to moment so if you find use in it or even if you don't please reach out to us and let us know your experiences um, that will help us so much as we continue to design and iterate and try to best meet your needs and better support all learners and our information is all in that digital handout. So you can email us, you can find us on Twitter, you can definitely you know, track us down. And we, um, we look forward to these conversations. This is Audra. I just wanna make one more comment um, that I, I think maybe we touch on a little bit, but it's a inclusion and lesson planning. There's not a silver bullet to this. And I think we're all looking for that. We're used to kind of that end all be all solution. And again, I think while this tool comes pretty close to that, um, I still think it's about us taking it and moving it beyond. And so again, your feedback, your input is so, so important to us. Um, you know, I've been te I was teaching for a long, long time and, and to think it took us this long and maybe there's something out there similar, but it took us this long to kind of get to this point and get this out. Um, I can only think, you know, and hope that we'll have something, you know, continue to build off of that for the future. So thank you all. to chime in again um just to thank you all again um from the thai center from cast for joining us here at the educating all learners alliance um, i'd of course like to thank our participants for joining us um, and sharing i know it looks like a hundred percent of our participants downloaded that handout so that's great we don't have to worry about any of you um, not having it, which we, you know, we made it for you. So please, um, if by any chance you weren't able to access it, follow up. Um, my email um, is available in your registration link, as well as my colleague Erin. Um, but I'd like to thank all of our presenters for joining us. 
And again, just a reminder to take action with these resources. The current tool is available in that link provided. Um, and follow up if any of the information in the slides would be useful for you today, and we can send that to you. Again, my name is Gabrielle Oates with the Educating All Learners Alliance. Uh, and that concludes our session for today. So thanks, everybody. We look forward to seeing you again soon. All righty. Bye, all.